Good morning, everyone. We'll go ahead and get started. So I'm Mark Lundstrom. I'm Interim Dean of Engineering. Uh, and if we're fortunate, the next Dean of Engineering will be with us to close out this morning's session. So that'll be neat. So uh, let me first of all introduce our four associate professors that we'll be hearing from uh, Dr. Harsha Honapa from Industrial Engineering. Harsha is here. Right. <laughs> Uh, and Joseph Raspoli from Biomedical Engineering, uh, Ivan Kristoff from Mechanical Engineering, Ivan, and Christopher Goldenstein, from, also from Mechanical Engineering. All right, so it's great to be uh, with you all today. I really look forward to these sessions. So you've all achieved a recent milestone, and uh, what this means is that your colleagues have confidence in you to make the right decisions about where you can have the most impact on your students and your technical communities and beyond the campus, and that we look forward to working with you for, for many years. So, you know, when you achieve a milestone like this, it's useful to pause and think about how did I get here and what's next for me, and that's what this session is all about. You know, there are a lot of transitions and changes that are going on here at Purdue, so we're at the end of the Mitch Daniels decade and at the beginning of what I hope will be the Meng Cheng decade. And we have a transition in deans of engineering going on. So it's useful just to stop and think about where we are and, and where we're headed as a university and as a college. And I think it's about scale and excellence and impact. So scale is about our land grant mission to provide the best education we have to as many students as we can. Uh, excellence is about providing that education uh, at a level that's second to none, but also at a level of our research that is second to none. And you know, excellence at scale, that's what we're all about, and that's, that's really a big challenge. And impact, you know, it goes along with excellence, but it's having an impact, making the world a different place, really making a difference in our technical communities and beyond our technical communities in society as well. So with that, I will uh, turn the floor over to Dr. Youngjun Sun to introduce our first speaker. Thank, thank you, Dean Lundstrom. So it's my uh, great pleasure to introduce Dr. Uh, Hasha Honapa, who uh, joined uh, Purdue 2015 after completing his PhD at USC Electrical Engineering. Harsha also had uh, industry positions uh, such as uh, FICO, uh, Indian Institute of Science, and uh, Bell Labs, okay, as well. And uh, Harsha, we will hear a lot more about his actually technical work, but he is the uh, expert on mathematical modeling and analysis of uh, stochastic systems. Core centers and Uber rider, you know, the uh, uh, shared riding systems, and uh, cloud computing services and hospitals, and you will see the waiting line everywhere, and Harsha helped to reduce those uh, waiting line in our every uh, day uh, you know, their life. And Harsha received the, uh, several uh, prestigious awards, including NSF uh, Career Award, and also he received the Best uh, Outstanding uh, Graduate Mentor Award from College of Engineering, and then uh, his PhD dissertation received the best PhD dissertation in queuing theory that is provided biannually, provided by European Conference on Queuing Theory. That's a very, very prestigious one, okay? So in terms of the uh, educational and uh, 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 you know, um, service contributions, Harsha also actually uh, excels. And uh, so Harsha uh, is currently faculty advisor for INFORM's uh, student chapter at Purdue and has uh, uh, advised several senior design projects. And I really like this one. So Harsha has been working with our undergraduate advisors to develop a predictive model of uh, student performance so that we can provide the, uh, the, uh, uh, you know, the, the enabling data-driven uh, student advising at scale, okay? So, and then uh, uh, several months ago, Harsha proposed this idea that he wanna use AI to, you know, the, uh, try in his course to write uh, much of the, you know, code 
you know, programming code from scratch, now everyone knows that's a chat GPT. And Harsha is very interested in innovating uh, this uh, education uh, platform and technology in classes. Let's welcome Dr. Honapa. Well, thank you everyone for being here. Um, it's a real pleasure uh, to be talking to you. So I thought about what to talk about, and eventually I decided that I'd talk uh, sort of a parable about my journey and how I ended up here talking to you. So uh, I should start by thanking my wife, Ashwini, uh, who is there in that corner over there. Uh, I'm here, standing here, thanks to her encouragement and her patience with my ranting, <laughs> you know, with my work and you know, the progress I'm making or not making. Um, you know, we built a very intricate and complex and interesting life, I would say, sort of like that uh, Eiffel Tower that we built uh, over the Christmas break. Um, and uh, I should also point out the character who is very nonplussed here. That's Yuki, our dog. Um, she doesn't like hugs, but she's a lot of fun. Um, I should point out that I am sort of in the doghouse with Ashwini a little bit uh, because she runs a podcast called Through the Corporate Glass uh, where she explores uh, people's career choices and she's asked me repeatedly to come on this podcast and talk about my career choices and I've refused saying that I don't like navel gazing. And yet here I am, navel gazing. So Ashwini, I'll be on the podcast at some point. You've done 67. I don't know, I don't think I can be the 68th, but maybe the 75th or something, I don't know, we'll see. <laughs> um, all right, so uh, before I get into my story, I should point out that my success is sort of premised on, uh, you know, uh, several people, uh, most importantly, my students, some of whom are here. Uh, my graduate students at the top, I've worked with a whole bunch of them, some of them are, are in IE, some of them are in math, some in stats. Um, the second row are some undergraduates that I work with um, and I continue to work with. I always love working with undergraduate students because you know, they bring enthusiasm and joy uh, to their work. They love to learn. Um, and of course, mentors and colleagues, I will mention some of them as I go along. Uh, so this is usually the slide that I flash when I try to explain what I work on. Uh, I think Son did a good job. Uh, I don't think my work is going to help reduce waiting times in the short run, but maybe in the long run. Uh, but I mostly work with uh, probabilistic tools. I analyze stochastic systems, increasingly machine learning and uh, you know, optimization uh, methods. Um, okay, so let me get into uh, my journey and how I ended up here. So it's sort of a peripatetic decade, I would say, before I got to Purdue. Um, so my story starts in Bangalore, or Bengaluru as it's called today in our local language. Um, in fact, my story starts with a failure. Like I desperately wanted to get into the Indian Institute of Technology, um, which if you know anything about India and technology, I mean, that's the place you want to go. And I didn't make it. Uh, instead, I, uh, I didn't pass the exam. So I had to attend a, a local engineering college, as we call it, uh, in India. And I studied electrical um, engineering, well, electronics and communications engineering, to be more precise. And I wouldn't claim to be at the top of my class. I, I would, I mean, I was really interested in the work, but I, I would never was at the top. But along the way, I had the opportunity to work at the Indian Institute of Science uh, as part of my senior thesis. So I spent a lot of time with my friend, uh, just the two of us, uh, my uh, uh, classmate, where we worked on uh, protocols for sensor networks. And so this was at a time when sensor networks were a big deal. Um, and we were trying to analyze some existing uh, sensor network protocols. And as part of that, we sort of decided that, okay, you know, it's really hard to control these little devices on these networks. And so we needed like a sort of probabilistic algorithm. And we just couldn't come up with one because we didn't have the mathematical capability to do it. We didn't understand probability stochastics well enough. And both of us decided that, okay, we have to go to grad school. And that's how I ended up at uh, USC, uh, University of Southern California. In 2004, immediately after I graduated, I decided I'd go there and study communications protocols and some information theory, and thinking that I would somehow become a communications engineer. Uh, the very first class that I took at USC was on probability theory, and that really opened my eyes. That's when I sort of understood that, okay, I need to be in probability. I need to understand stochastics. And I want to be a more of a probabilist than anything else, more than an engineer. And I also got really interested in machine learning at that time. 
And so I was very privileged to work at the Information Sciences Institute at uh, USC uh, in the Artificial Intelligence Division um, on uh, you know, basically some you know, machine learning algorithm for uh, chunking up a, a sequence of characters into words. We were trying to decide you know, where do words emerge from. So sort of like a proto-language uh, model, if you like. Um, so at the end of this period, like 2006, I sort of had a choice to make. So this is the first choice that I had to make, which was, do I continue and do a PhD, or do I go and work in industry? And for some reason, I decided that um, you know, I'd rather go work in the industry because I want to see how machine learning is used. So I just want to point out that this is in 2006. So today, if you say I want to work in machine learning, it's like, yeah, whatever. Of course, you should be working in machine learning. Not so much in 2006. Also, I somehow decided that I want to work on neural networks. I was convinced that there's a job out there that uses neural networks and solves a really important business problem. I didn't know what it was. And I spent several months searching. And eventually, I did find a job uh, in San Diego uh, at this company called FICO. or It was called as Fair Isaac back, back then. Now it's called as FICO. You're all probably familiar with FICO scores, you know, intimately familiar. They had a division in San Diego that used neural networks to do credit card and debit card fraud detection. And I you know, ended up there uh, working in this. Yeah. And, um, but basically, let me just point out that uh, this particular uh, team uh, you know, was one of the first ones to use neural networks to do this type of work. Um, so somewhere in, in the middle between 2006 and 2009, um, Ashwini and I decided that we wanted to get married. And she said, I'll never come to the US. So obviously, I had to pack up and go back, uh, though she's here now. So you know, never say never, I think. <laughs> so I went back to India, and I worked at uh, IAC. This is what Son was uh, mentioning. This was a, uh, a research uh, group that was funded by this company called Satyam, and it was inside IASE. And I had the privilege of working with Professor Shala Bhatnagar on uh, reinforcement learning and simulation. So this is what really piqued my interest to come back to USC and uh, do a PhD with uh, Rahul Jain, Professor Rahul Jain, and Professor Amy Ward. Um, I thought I'd come back and work on reinforcement learning and simulation, but I got really interested in game theory and queuing theory. And uh, part of my thesis was studying how people make choices on when to arrive at a queue. Um, and along the way, I had to develop several queuing theoretic models which is how I ended up work working with uh, Professor Amy Ward in the business school. Um, so what did I do to get this job? So besides you know, working on really interesting problems, thanks to Amy and Rahul, uh, I, so this is sort of a pointer to the young people in the audience. I reached out, so uh, you know, around 2013, I was uh, interning at Bell Labs. And that was my, the first thing that I started thinking about, should I go into academia at this point? Because I was sort of convinced that I couldn't make it. And, you know, on Rahul's encouragement and Amy's encouragement, I reached out to several professors at Stanford and Berkeley just to talk to them and give talks, you know, there and get their feedback on what I'm working on. So I reached out to Jean Waldron uh, and Rhonda Reiter, who are uh, at uh, Berkeley, and Peter Glynn uh, at Stanford. And I owe Peter Glynn an immense, uh, you know, debt of gratitude because he was the chair of the MSNE department at Stanford. But he would carve out 30 minutes every Friday, where I would go and talk to him about my thesis. Right? And I would, you know, we would discuss problems uh, that would come out of my thesis. And I think before I went and spoke to Peter, I wasn't convinced about the quality of what I'd done. But after I spoke to him, I sort of understand, understood it so much better. And I saw so much value in what I had done, that when I came to give a talk at Purdue or wherever, I think my talks were much more insightful and interesting and useful to people. And I think that's part of the reason why I have this job. And so I, I you know, owe Peter uh, you know, an immense debt of gratitude. OK, so what about the road to tenure? I have um, a couple of decisions that I made. So early on, I had some success getting funded to study non-stationary queuing models. This was all like sort of based on my thesis. But I decided to expand my interests in that area a little bit. Um, so I you know, started working on a little bit of control, reinforcement learning, stochastic models. But I also expanded the people that I was working with. So uh, I started working with folks in math and um, uh, business schools and, of course, in operations research. So these are all some of the colleagues that I worked with. I also received a couple of patents just because I wanted to see how the patent system worked. That was with Vijay there at the, uh, at the end. Um, and 
another decision that I made was to sort of uh, uh, make sort of a decisive shift in my research interest. So I decided that I wanted a new research direction, in particular working on uh, getting closer to machine learning, thinking about statistics and theoretical statistics a little bit. And so I started, I wanted to use like these probabilistic tools to analyze, you know, machine learning and optimization. So all of these things sort of lead me to like distill some knowledge that hopefully uh, is useful to people. I don't know if it's useful. Uh, I thought I had come up with this, but then I realized that Steve Jobs had sort of said something very similar <laughs> in his uh, commencement address. So be hungry, be foolish. So be foolish, take risks. Um, like that's a decisive shift around 2017. The upside is that you learn a lot work on new things all the time. The downside is that there's a high probability of failure. Uh, you'll, you may find yourself on an island. Uh, you have to find a community, and, or you have to join a community and speak their language, which is a hard thing to do. I found myself in that boat, um, but you know, I can't begrudge any of the decisions that I made because it did lead to my career award. Uh, as far as hunger goes, I would say that this is the most interesting thing. Uh, try to work towards a purpose, but enjoy the, the process. And this is a quote by uh, Raghu Pashupati, who is our colleague here in statistics, whom I consider to be a faculty mentor. And one last thing is ask for help. You know, don't be shy to reach out to people. People are nicer than you think. Um, and I've been the recipient of kindness for many people. And let me end there. Thank you. Thank you for a great presentation, Harsha. Thanks, so any question for Dr. Honapa? Yes. So, so in Son's introduction, I think he mentioned some work on, uh, on a model to predict the success of students. Yes. So what do you see as the possibilities for using these techniques to deal, to improve the student experience in a program that's as large as ours. Yeah. Are, are there opportunities there? I think there are, yeah. So, so um, the thing that I'm working on right now, and we made some progress on it, is, you know, when I think about IE, for example, right? So we have, I don't know how many undergrads, is it 800? Mm -hmm. Over 800. Over 800. And I think we have four academic advisors, right? So just think about the, you know, the amount of pressure that they're under to provide, you know, useful advice. And the other problem that I see is students, um, it is it's sort of a, um, we need the students to reach out to us for advisement. But can we sort of turn it around? Like, can we sort of make it predictive so that you can reach out to students saying, hey, you know, you need to improve this, or maybe you're really good, maybe you should consider going into grad school, you know, or maybe take these courses, it'll help you be more successful as a grad student. So how do we do this in a more predictive way? And one thing that uh, I've noticed is uh, students have a profile, right? I mean, there are certain types of students. Can we sort of suss this out from data? Mm -hmm. And so we've been building some machine learning models, like credit, sort of like credit risk scoring models to predict the uh, success or failure of students. Just pro give a probabilistic assessment of whether they are likely to be successful or you know, are they likely to fail out or you know, how do we, uh, and you know, using this to sort of, uh, in a sort of predictive way, so that we can reach out to students and, in that way, sort of you know, reach that scale that you're talking about. Yeah. And the other thing that he talked about was uh, this uh, codex stuff. Like, so the GPT, uh, well, OpenAI has this thing called as GPT codex, GPT three codex. So you enter natural language text, and it produces uh, automatically produces code, like you know, computer code. So we use that to solve all the homework problems uh, in, in optimization and production systems. Um, and so you know, one uh, sort of uh, friction that I see in our students, uh, IE undergraduates, is uh, you know, th they're not necessarily the best programmers. Right? Because they're there to be industrial engineers, not necessarily to be computer programmers. So how do we like, help them with that? And uh, you know, if, can we use Codex in a way that it gives them, it helps them sort of write better code? And so they learn better you know, on the modeling front, which is what we want them to uh, pick up. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. So I think you can hear me. Mm. No, no, we have okay. Very exciting talk, very inspirational. Uh, I did notice you talk about around 2006, um, you tumble into uh, data mining and neural networks. 
And it's my recollection around that time, neural networks were dying, or were dying. Yep. And for a lot of students, many of them sitting in this room, perhaps they're also dreaming of the next big technology wonder. And so can you talk about what made you continue uh, along the line of machine learning mm. and neural networks? Yeah, um, that's a good question. So, I mean, as I said, I'm kind of foolish, <laughs> right? So I tend to do these things. At that time, I, um, I was just convinced that there was a job, that somebody was using neural networks somewhere, even though it was sort of a AI winter, I think, at that point. Um, I, I honestly don't have a good answer for you there. I just I was just convinced that the job existed, and I hunted, you know, and it was there. They were using neural networks to do it. Um, I, I think you can't get too caught up in current trends, is what I would say. Like, is something fundamentally useful? Is something, you know, like for example, when I think about um, like ChatGPT, right? Like today, like this is what everyone is talking about. I think ChatGPT is kind of a fundamental tool. Um, to me, it feels like you know I'm old enough to remember 1999 and you know experiencing Google for the first time, because for people too young, Alta Vista was horrible, like so bad, like you would enter a search query and you would only find the answer to what you're searching for on the fifth page of the search results. Right? So Google was like a revelation, and I feel like ChatGPT is sort of something like that. Now, should you work on chat GPT or you know, large language models? Maybe, right? I think there is an interesting uh, you know, problem that's immediately apparent with these types of technologies, which is uh, you know, it takes, I, I read somewhere that it takes about seven times as much uh, computing power and energy to answer a chat GPT query compared to Google search, right? So there's, there's an interesting engineering problem there. Like how do you like shrink that? So there are things that you can work on. Like even though this sounds like something that's um, you know too hot right now, I think there are fundamental questions there, and I think these types of technologies are fundamentally useful. Okay, yeah. I hear time's up. Okay. okay. So thank you, Dr. Honapa. Look forward to seeing your continued continued success. Let's thank give you, a big hands to Dr. Honapa. Thanks.